looking to scale the dizzying heights of a grade nine for your GCSE English Literature examination on Pride and Prejudice, look no further. This extensive video will give you the tools you need to increase your chance of achieving such vertiginous success. Some detailed insight into what life was like during Austin's time, tick. Detailed exploration and adaptable quotations for the key themes of pride, prejudice, family and marriage, tick. The assessment objectives and mark scheme explained in jargonless English, tick. An explanation of how this achieve, how this response achieves a grade nine, tick. Stay tuned, this is a Schofield on Shakespeare guide to the AQA English Literature Examination on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. To make it easier for some of you to skip straight to a particular area of weakness or interest, each slide is colour coded at the top and the timings for each section can be found within the description of the video. Purple explains the format of the exam. Blue shows how the exam is marked, including the descriptors from the top band mark scheme. Dark orange gives insight into the education system during Austin's time. Light orange gives some invaluable information about the very different landscape of love and relationships. Dark green explores the theme of pride. Light green, prejudice. Yellow looks at the theme of family, whilst light yellow explores the theme of marriage. Finally, the sample answer has a black header, which becomes grey when this response is analysed and related to the mark scheme. Pride and Prejudice is examined within the paper entitled Paper 1, Shakespeare and the 19th Century Novel. You have one hour and 45 minutes to write two essays, which are essentially equally weighted, excluding the additional four marks for the accuracy of your writing given to your Shakespeare essay. There is no choice of questions. You will be given an extract for the novel, and expected to write in detail about it in relation to a particular question. However, you will also need to extend your response to relate your ideas about the extract to the novel as a whole. You will therefore need to have memorised some quotations on different themes and characters before walking into that examination hall. And what skills will you be expected to demonstrate when writing your essay? Well, for assessment objective one, you will need to make intelligent perceptive points which answer the question and show a comprehensive understanding of both the passage and the novel as a whole. As ever with English literature, carefully chosen quotations can help give further insight and ensure you are not just coming out with limp-ish generalisations. And you need to be analysing your quotations. What do tricky words mean? And what are their effects, i.e. how does the writer's language help her achieve a particular effect, such as, for example, encouraging the reader to consider Mr Collins ridiculous, or sympathise with Eliza? What about the structure of her writing, both at sentence and broader levels? What effects do these have? Austin's world was completely different to the world we inhabit. How? And to what extent does this affect our interpretations of characters and events, and how we respond? Regularly include a few sentences about the context towards the end of your paragraphs to help you develop your points further. Let's now move from general assessment objectives to the specifics of what is required to get a top band, which will incorporate the grade 9. Some interesting words here including conceptualise. How should we interpret this? Well, the Cambridge Dictionary defines it thus, 
And to me, this adjective emphasises the importance of not just telling us what happens in the novel, but actually persistently ensuring what you write relates to the ideas and concept required by the question. Too often, space and time can be wasted with a long description of Mr Darcy doing this, or Eliza saying that, when actually what is required is what these actions or words reveal about their characters, or what Austen is trying to say about an idea or theme. Overall, surely what the examiner is looking for are intelligent, probing, delving points relating to the question, extracting quotations and ideas from both the extract given and the novel as a whole. Note also the use of the word judicious for your quotations. Your quotations are not unnecessarily long and not just included because you have memorised them and are hell-bent on using them irrespective of whether they are really relevant. No, your quotations are short, precise and flowingly embedded into your writing. They help give you further detail and insight to the points you're making. But it's no use plonking quotations down and thinking, job done. You must explore the effect of particular words used, or the effect of certain language devices used such as similes, metaphor or irony. How do certain words subtly influence our interpretations as readers, our reactions to events and characters? Probe delve. And towards the end of your paragraphs, weave in points about the context, about how, for example, attitudes to marriage and religion were very different to nowadays, how opportunities for women were so much more restricted, thus explaining more pertinently, for example, why Charlotte Lucas marries Mr Collins, when a 21st century female equivalent surely wouldn't go anywhere near that crushing bore. Time to explore the context in greater detail, starting with education. Austen's world was not the world of today in which girls rout routinely outperform boys in many public exams at 16 and 18. Whereas boys could be educated privately at home by a tutor, or attend classes at the home of a gentleman scholar, or attend a public school such as Eton or Winchester College, most upper-class girls of this period would be taught at home by either their mothers or governesses, resulting in a very variable education, and one invariably much more narrow in scope than their male counterparts. In Pride and Prejudice, Mr Bennett's general ironic detached stance on life, combined with Mrs Bennett's general air of unhelpful, hysterical melodrama, indirectly resulted in the daughters essentially choosing what they wanted to learn. In chapter 29, confronted by a typically haughty and belligerent Lady Catherine, Eliza is forced to confess that she and her sisters had neither a governess or a mother overly slavish about their education. She reveals, Such of us as wished to learn never wanted the means. We were always encouraged to read and had all the masters that were necessary. Those who chose to be idle certainly might. As Maggie Lane reveals in Jane Austen's world, such masters would be teaching the girls accomplishments to help make them good value in the evening circle, to help provide something beyond polite chit-chat after dinner. Such skills would generally consist of drawing, dancing and music, but even the acquirements of these accomplishments had a specific male-centric purpose. Again, to quote Maggie Lane, their purpose was not to bring pleasure and improvement to herself, though of course that was sometimes the case. Rather, they were embellishments to increase her attractiveness to potential marriage partners and to make her an asset in social gatherings. So not only was the scope of female ed education pitifully narrow, but you could also argue that it was not considered important in its own right, but only as a facilitator towards the essential financial security and respect of a good marriage. Nowadays, there's probably one remaining tradition from the days in which men held all the cards when it came to initiating relationships, the marriage proposal. Unless I'm hopelessly and befuddledly out of date, most women like the idea of the man getting down on one knee and proposing marriage, even if he's been told by her to do it the day before, 
as was the case with my own most romantic marriage proposal within an inner city, not in a backyard. But in Austin's time, a woman had a purely passive role. To respond to a man's attentions before his intentions were known was to risk the ridicule of other people or the pain of disappointment. So she must appear hardly to notice and to certainly attach no significance to male attentions until the moment of proposal. This meant that women had to tread an extraordinarily fine, delicate line between mysteriously suggesting to the man that his intentions were not unwelcome and following the rules of propriety by feigning a degree of indifference to him. In Pride and Prejudice, Jane Bennett fails to achieve this impossible sounding balance, which almost loses her the loving husband and financial saviour of Mr Bingley. In chapter 58, Mr Darcy states again that at the time of their supposedly inappropriate courtship, at least in his judgement, he felt that Jane was indifferent to his good friends and consequently used this as fuel to discourage any permanent attachment. To the modern reader, the expectations for Georgian women all sound rather ridiculous and certainly unfair. Women relied upon men for both their financial and social survival, yet still had to play a ludicrous game of cloaked cat and mouse in order to manipulate the right man into marriage. Now on to themes. The first theme I'd like to tackle is that of pride. In the character of Mr Darcy, Austin shows us that those who learn through experience and reflection to evolve from excessive pride become more rounded human beings with the potential for greater happiness. At the beginning of the novel, Darcy is extraordinarily proud and all too aware of his own elevated social status, so much so that he disdains others and unwittingly exhibits ungentlemanlike rudeness. At a ball held at Neverfield Park, Darcy is overheard refusing to dance with Eliza Bennet, responding to his close friend Mr Bingley's suggestion, She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me, and I am in no humour at present to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. You had better return to your partner and enjoy her smiles, for you are wasting your time with me. In Darcy's defence, he claims he detests dancing unless he is particularly acquainted with his partner. But nonetheless, his language here drips with unnecessary, potentially extremely hurtful, aloof scorn. The use of the adjective tolerable objectifies Eliza in terms of her appearance, suggesting that it is of a quality which is acceptable, but certainly not good enough for him whilst the suggestion that he needs to be tempted to act implies a distastefully smug view of his own value and worth. Thus it is a great surprise to Eliza Bennet, but not perhaps the discerning reader, when in chapter 34 Darcy proposes marriage to her. During this proposal it is clear that Darcy is torn between his pride and sense of his own worth and his feelings for Eliza a poor, albeit upper-class woman, with astoundingly embarrassing relatives, most notably her mother and younger sisters. Austin switches to indirect speech to summarise these conflicting feelings. He was not more eloquent on the subject of tenderness than of pride. His sense of her inferiority, of its being a degradation, of the family obstacles which judgment had always opposed to inclination, were dwelt on with a warmth which seemed due to the consequences he was wounding, but was very unlikely to recommend his suit. The use of anaphora in the repetition of of at the beginning of successive clauses, of her inferiority, of its being a degradation, of the family obstacles, succinctly sweeps in successive implicit criticisms of the woman he professes to love, and the understated narrator observes that such blunt manifestations of his pride were likely to significantly reduce the chances of his proposal being accepted. Eliza rejects the proposal, much to Darcy's astonishment, but the events of the second half of the novel show that Darcy has learnt from the experience and is endeavouring to become a better, less proud human being. Reflecting on the language of his first proposal, he tells Eliza, 
my behaviour to you at the time had merited the severest reproof. It was unpardonable. I cannot think of it without abhorrence. The use of these superlative severest and the subsequent simple sentences, it was unpardonable. I cannot think of it without abhorrence, show unequivocally the extent to which Darcy has self-condemned following Eliza's enlightenment. Abhorrence is a stronger word than hatred, incorporating an element of disgusted loathing into the feelings of intense dislike. Such strong language clearly highlights the extent to which Darcy now recognises the value of humane decency over excessive pride and he is rewarded with a fulfilling, equal-ish marriage, and a partner whom he will be able to respect far more, say, than the obsequious, irritating Caroline Bingley. In Darcy, Austen shows the evolution from excessive pride to good human tolerance, and the potential rewards available for such a transition. However, excessively proud characters in the novel who remain static, who do not evolve, are treated with a generous dollop of Austen's famous light-touch mocking or satire. Two notable examples of this are Mr Collins and Lady Catherine de Bourgh. The former omits far too much self-satisfaction, although all too aware of his inferior social rank. This is clearly shown even before he first appears in person in the novel through a pompous letter sent to Mr. Bennett, which the latter clearly finds hilariously ridiculous. As with all his appearances in the novel, he very quickly makes reference to the Right Honourable Lady Catherine de Bourgh, whose bounty and beneficence has preferred me to the valuable rectory of this parish, where it shall be my earnest endeavour to demean myself with grateful respect towards her ladyship. The clue to Austen's attitude towards this figure lies particularly within the use of the verb demean. In the 19th century, this could have a neutral meaning, to behave or carry oneself, as well as the meaning that we understand nowadays, to debase or cause to become less respected. Mr Collins' use of this word is humorous, as it unwittingly results in him revealing the ironic truth about his preoccupation with Lady Catherine, particularly when read by modern readers who may only know the non-neutral definition of the word, i.e. to lower oneself as well as live within a far less hierarchical society. Rather than raising him in the eyes of the world and society, it simply exposes him as a substanceless leech devoid of genuine respect for himself, and pathetically attracted to the glitter of wealth and aristocracy. Whereas Darcy evolves, both Mr Collins and Lady Catherine remain static throughout the novel in terms of their rigid, excessive pride, which stifles and narrows their perspective on what is really important in life. Austen persistently satirises both characters to gently poke fun at their pretensions. Chapter 19 is particularly amusing and features Mr Collins's proposal to Elizabeth. He begins it thus. My reasons for marrying are, first, that I think it a right thing for every clergyman in easy circumstances, like myself, to set the example of matrimony in the, his parish. Secondly, that I am convinced that it will add very greatly to my happiness. And thirdly, which perhaps I ought to have mentioned earlier, that it is the particular advice and recommendation of the very noble lady whom I have the honour of calling patroness. Not one of these three reasons mentions anything at all about Elizabeth, and indeed could be directed at any woman on the planet. Such self-centredness smacks of smug pride, whilst Mr Collins's total lack of awareness that such tactics are unlikely to endear himself to his proposed partner becomes amusing and ensure he becomes an object of fun for the reader. How does Austin encourage the reader to chuckle at such self-absorption, such misplaced pompous pride within the extract on screen? Well, the systematic use of connectives, firstly, secondly, thirdly, is far more appropriate for, for example, a man methodically ordering goods at a shop and ticking them off a list, rather than a marriage proposal, which even in the early 19th century 
in which marrying for reasons other than love was far more socially acceptable um, than nowadays should at least give the impression of, of passionate spontaneity. Additionally, the possessive pronoun my within the idea that the marriage will add very greatly to my happiness so blatantly excludes the person he is marrying and indeed correctly implies that this person will not quite be so happy that the reader cannot help but laugh at his presumption. Finally, the pompous phrasing of which perhaps I ought to have mentioned earlier in obsequious reference to Lady Catherine's advice shows that even at the height of supposed romantic desire, Mr. Collins cannot remove himself from his emasculating obsession with status and a single member of the aristocracy. To sum up this short tip of the iceberg exploration of the theme of pride, excessive pride is shown to be unhealthy and inhumane. Those who remain excessively proud throughout the novel see their influence diminished and their pretensions lightly mocked. Whereas those who learn to reduce their excessive pride become far happier, more rounded human beings. What is prejudice? Well, it's defined by the Cambridge Dictionary as unfair or unreasonable opinion or feeling, especially when formed without enough thought or knowledge. And in Pride and Prejudice, Austin shows that it is as important to learn and evolve from past prejudices as excessive pride. Whilst Darcy progresses from excessive pride to more humane sensitivity, so the course of the novel sees Elizabeth on a path to greater self-understanding and a re-evaluation of her own ability to make correct judgments about people. Early in the novel, Elizabeth makes up her mind that Darcy is a proud, inhumane, spoilt brat who is terribly wrongs, charming, good-natured Mr Wickham. In chapter 26, Ignorant of his opportunistic, conniving self-absorption, she raves about him to her aunt, Mrs Gardiner. But Mr Wickham is, beyond all comparison, the most agreeable man I ever saw, and if he becomes really attached to me, I believe it would be better that he should not. I see the imprudence of it. Oh, that abominable Mr Darcy! My father's opinion of me does the greatest honour, and I shall be miserable to forfeit it. Eliza's blurred judgment is implied through her fragmentary, jagged syntax. She switches abruptly, as shown through the repeated dashes, between praise for Mr Wickham, to illusory speculation about the future, to an attempt to be sensible, to a loud exclamation condemning Darcy, to a recognition of the value she puts on her father's good opinion of her. These abrupt shifts illustrate the fact that Eliza is not able to think with full clarity and logic about either Wickham or Darcy, and that her judgement has become impaired, partly through her social and sexual delight in Wickham's company. It is only towards the middle of the book that Eliza recognises her prejudice, surprisingly poor judgement when it comes to the two men. Reading and re-reading Darcy's letter following his unsuccessful marriage proposal, she rebukes herself, lamenting, Wickham's behaviour to herself could not have had no tolerable motive. He had either been deceived with regard to her fortune, or had been gratifying his vanity by encouraging the preference which she believed she had most incautiously shown. Every lingering struggle in his favour grew fainter and fainter, and in further justification of Mr Darcy, she could not but allow that Mr Bingley, when questioned by Jane, had long ago asserted his blamelessness in the affair, that proud and repulsive as were his manners, she had never seen anything that betrayed him to be unprincipled or unjust, anything that spoke him of irreligious or immoral habits. Eliza's self-chastisement is seen in her describing her acceptance of Wickham's particular attentions to her as being most incautiously shown. Whilst in relation to Mr Darcy, she realises that she has been wrong in assuming that because someone is unpleasantly proud on the outside, they must be similarly unpleasant and corrupt within. 
And so, as she admits to her new fiancé, Darcy, in Chapter 58, the effect of the letter is to gradually remove all her former prejudices, ultimately leaving her open to love and an equal-ish relationship with a man who has been on a similar journey of greater self-understanding in relation to his pride. Austin's presentation of The Family differs markedly from our own experience as modern readers. Whereas nowadays we are resolutely determined to express ourselves and to be seen as individuals, the world of Pride and Prejudice shows the close integration of families. Families who, irrespective of the wishes of individual members, will be viewed and judged collectively. In the early chapters of the novel, both Eliza and Jane find themselves repeatedly embarrassed by their mother and to a lesser and perhaps more forgivable extent, their younger sisters. Mrs Bennet, described in chapter one as a woman of mean understanding, little information and uncertain temper, is frequently tactless and overbearing, which causes her to overstep the bounds of propriety and, ironically, severely hinders the sole business of her life getting her daughters married. This is seen most notably in chapter 18 during the Neverfield Ball, when she loudly boasts about Jane's forthcoming marriage to Mr Bingley, even though no such engagement has been announced or even suggested by either party. Austin uses indirect speech to write. Mrs Bennet seemed incapable of fatigue while enumerating the advantages of the match. He has been such a charming young man, and so rich, and living but three miles from them, were the first points of self-gratulation. Even with, within today's let-it-all-out culture, speaking blatantly about someone's wealth is frowned upon, and this would have been even more the case in Austin's time, in which public self-restraint and demure passivity would have been the correct social norm, especially for hopeful brides and their mothers awaiting proposals from the all-powerful man. Eliza's embarrassment at this ignorant impropriety is acute, and she fails utterly to rein her mother in. The conversation on screen is enlightening. Mrs Bennet scoffs, What is Mr Darcy to me, pray, that I should be afraid of him? I am sure we owe him no such particular civility as to be obliged to say nothing he may, may not like to hear. Mortified, Eliza responds, For heaven's sake, madam, speak lower. What advantage can it be to you to offend Mr Darcy? You would never recommend yourself to his friend by so doing. Mrs Bennet's words reveal a complacent pride in her own position and social status, and unfortunately this pride is utterly misplaced given the perilous situation of herself and her daughters once Mr Bennet dies. They will be kicked out of their home with very little money to live upon. And what of Mr Darcy, of whom Mrs Bennet snorts so contemptuously? Well, he is the owner of a fabulous estate in Derbyshire, Pen Pemberley, and has an income of £10,000 a year, which according to the Daily Telegraph in 2014 would equate to £800,000 a year. He is also Mr Bingley's closest friend and someone who has great influence over him. Common sense, common prudence would suggest reticence within his earshot might be a good idea, irrespective of any personal feelings of dislike. Yet Mrs Bennet simply doesn't get this. And crucially in the world of pride and prejudice, how your family members behave matters. Inappropriate behaviour by family members, particularly if the family doesn't have much money, can cost you dearly. So it proves in this case. Darcy convinces Mr Bingley to return with him to London, and the clear implication is that this is done to remove him from the temptation of an imprudent marriage with Jane Bennett and her family. The most obvious example in the novel of the collective importance of family, however, is seen in Lydia's elopement with the charmer villain Wickham and her family's reaction to this. Eliza is in Derbyshire when she receives Jane's letter alerting her to the event. In her eyes, such a family scandal must inevitably torpedo her own chances of a successful marriage and with it the financial solvency needed to survive following the death of her father. She looks at Darcy, tells him what has happened 
and interprets his contracted brow and gloomy air as signs of his realisation that an alliance between them must now be impossible. Elizabeth soon observed and instantly understood it. Her power was sinking. Everything must sink under such a proof of family weakness, such an assurance of the deepest disgrace. She could neither wonder nor condemn. If the novel had been written now, the author would surely have referred to the proof of Lydia's weakness, although that said, a 16-year-old running away for love would not cause the same amount of horror either. However, the phrase is family weakness, and so the implication is clear. What Lydia has done must reflect on every member of the family and imply collective moral turpitude. The superlative deepest to, to describe the disgrace suggests that nothing could shame the family more than such apparent disturbing female sexual desire and disregard for societal norms. Following this conversation, Darcy independently elects to find Wickham and bribe him financially into doing the right thing by marrying Lydia. Such an act actually shows Darcy's conventional acceptance of the notion of family responsibility as well as his own love for Eliza, by retrospectively imposing respectability on the Wickham and Lydia relationship, he is ensuring that a potential match between himself and Eliza remains a future possibility. Austin shows the frighteningly essential importance of marriage for women. They depend on it to secure respectable social position, and unless they have their own independent fortune, unlikely, they depend on it for their financial survival. Mrs. Bennet may be a target of Austin's satire, yet the fair-minded reader must recognise that her obsession with finding husbands for her five daughters stems from an acute appreciation of the necessity of marriage for their future well-being. It is the way she goes about conducting herself in relation to her aims, rather than the aims themselves, which Austin mocks. In chapter 13, her husband receives a gloriously solemn letter from Mr Collins, the heir to Longbourn, and thus the partial, unwitting cause of the urgency for the Bennet sisters to be married off. Hearing his name mentioned, Mrs Bennet cries semi-hysterically, Oh my dear, I cannot bear to hear that mentioned. Pray do not talk of that odious man. I do think it is the hardest thing in the world that your estate should be entailed away from your own children. And I'm sure if I had been you, I should have tried long ago to do something or other about it. The narrator continues, Jane and Elizabeth attempted to explain to her the nature of an entail. They had often attempted it before, but it was a subject on which Mrs. Bennet was beyond the reach of reason and she continued to rail bitterly against the cruelty of setting, settling an estate away from a family of five daughters in favour of a man whom nobody cared anything about. It is Mrs Bennet's lack of judgement and prudence, her stupidity even, which Austen is satirising in the extract on screen. The entailment system ensured that a family's name retained a certain status throughout the generations, the idea is that a family's land and property remained within the male side, rather than becoming amalgamated and sucked up, lost, within a different family's wealth. Whilst both contemporary and modern readers must sympathise with Mrs Bennet's worries, her semi-hysterical, dramatic imperative beseeching her family to pray do not talk of that odious man, smacks of unhelpful self-pitying. As a wife herself, she at least has a respectable upper-class husband. It is her daughters who are really in the perilous position. Whilst the gratuitous suggestion that Mr Collins is a man whom nobody cared anything about implies blatant self-serving ignorance at which the reader cannot help but laugh. So in her presentation of Mrs Bennet, Austen uses her understandable concerns about her daughters being married to satirise unhelpfully ignorant lack of reason and judgement. Austen also uses her own relationship with Mr Bennet to spotlight the problems of marrying for the wrong reasons. Throughout the novel it is clear that Mr Bennet never takes his wife seriously and prefers to respond to her emotional irrational outbursts with ironic comments which are amusing to the reader but which she doesn't get or understand. 
There are so many examples of this, but let's return to the previous extract shown on screen to see what Mr. Bennett says prior to reading out Mr. Collins's letter. Following his wife's bitter denunciations of Mr. Collins's position as heir to Longbourn, he quips, It certainly is a most iniquitous affair, and nothing can clear Mr. Collins from the guilt of inheriting Longbourn. The tone is unmistakably flippant, as seen in the superlative of most iniquitous, meaning extremely wrong and unfair, and the use of the legal term of guilt, which is appropriate only when someone has actively committed a crime, as opposed to passively being named as an heir. For the reader, these comments will provoke a wry smile. But later in the novel, Austen makes it clear that Mr. Bennett is unhappy in his marriage, and the first initial months aside, regrets it. In chapter 42, the narrator reveals, Eliza's father captivated by youth and beauty, and that appearance of good humour which youth and beauty generally give, had married a woman whose weak understanding and illiberal mind had very early in their marriage put an end to all real affection for her. Respect, esteem and confidence had vanished forever and all his views of domestic happiness were overthrown. This narrative could be interpreted to be mildly feminist in outlook, emphasising the importance of something approaching equality between men and women in marriage. Intelligent men marrying beautiful but comparatively ignorant women doesn't work. It results in the shattering of visions of homely contentment and the horrible sense of living with someone you can't respect. In the final chapters of the novel, Mr. Bennett is even more explicit about the importance of what he terms in equal marriage. Astonished by Mr. Darcy's proposal to Eliza, he warns the latter, I know your disposition, Lizzie. I know that you could be neither happy nor respectable unless you truly esteemed your husband, unless you looked up to him as a superior. Your lively talents would place you in the greatest danger in an unequal marriage. You could scarcely escape discredit and misery. My child, let me not have the grief of seeing you unable to respect your partner in life. Whilst modern day readers will be uncomfortable with the 19th century concept of the man as all knowledgeable, benign educator of the grateful female, the fact remains that Mr. Bennett is advocating a 19th century form of equality in marriage broadening Mrs. Bennett's narrow-minded perspective in which nothing matters beyond wealth and position, the words on screen suggest that genuine misery awaits for men and women who marry each other without the potential for a mental link, without a feeling that each other's mental capabilities merit respect. Mr. Bennett should be reassured, for actually the relationship of Darcy and Eliza Bennett is like this. They do respect and love each other's minds, as well as, presumably, wanting to ravage each other in the bedroom. Rather like Benedict and Beatrice in Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, the man doesn't want a beautiful, passive sucker-upper, but instead respects a woman who is either impertinent or has liveliness of mind, depending on your perspective. This is an idealistic view of marriage. But the ending to Pride and Prejudice suggests that in marriage we should aim to combine practical considerations about money and social status with a genuine intellectual connection with our partner. But Austen is not just an idealist but a realist as well. She recognises that such a combination is not always possible and that marriages solely to achieve financial security and social position occur and may not be entirely miserable. In chapter 38, Eliza reflects on her old friend Charlotte Lucas's marriage to Mr. Collins. She concludes, poor Charlotte, it was melancholy to leave her to such society. But she had chosen it with her eyes open, and though evidently regretting that her visitors were to go, she did not seem to ask for compassion. Her home and her housekeeping, her parish and her poultry, and all their dependent concerns had not yet lost their charms. In other words, life is not just about marriage and a partner. We do not live exclusively tied to a husband or a wife for every second of our lives. A degree of fulfilment is possible elsewhere. Let's now move to a practice question. Here goes. Starting with this extract. 
write about how Austin presents attitudes towards men. Write about how Austin presents attitudes towards men in this extract. How Austin presents attitudes towards men in the novel as a whole. The extract is taken from chapter 3 in which Mr Bingley, Mr Darcy are seen for the first time at the assembly room dance. I'll read the extract now. Mr Bingley was good looking and gentlemanlike. He had a pleasant countenance and easy, unaffected manners. His sisters were fine women with an air of decided fashion. His brother-in-law, Mr Hurst, merely looked the gentleman but his friend Mr Darcy soon drew the attention of the room by his fine, tall person, handsome features, noble mien, and the report which, which was in general circulation within five minutes after his entrance of his having ten thousand a year. The gentleman pronounced him to be a fine figure of a man. The ladies declared he was much handsomer than Mr Bingley, and he was looked at with great admiration for about half the evening, till his manners gave a disgust which turned the tide of his popularity, for he was discovered to be proud, to be above his company, and above being pleased, and not all his large estate in Derbyshire could then save him from having a most forbidding, disagreeable countenance, and being unworthy to be compared with his friends. Mr Bingley had soon made himself acquainted with all the principal people in the room. He was lively and unreserved, danced every dance, was angry that the ball closed so early, and talked of giving one himself at Neverfield. Such amiable qualities must speak for themselves. What a contrast between him and his friends. Mr Darcy danced only once with Mrs Hurst and once with Miss Bingley, declined being introduced to any other lady, and spent the rest of the evening in walking about the room, speaking occasionally to one of his own party. His character was decided. He was the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world, and everybody hoped that he would never come there again. Amongst the most violent against him was Mrs Bennet, whose dislike of his general behaviour was sharpened into particular resentment by his having slighted one of her daughters. Here's my response. The writer suggests that men are judged to a significant extent by their wealth, Generally speaking, the wealthier the man is, the more highly he is respected. In this extract, this is shown by a reference to Darcy's income, following a brief description of his appearance. There was a report, which was in general circulation within five minutes after his entrance, of his having 10,000 a year. The fact that his income is known within a large gathering after such a short period of time highlights the great importance and interest in a person's wealth, which in Austin's time would have almost invariably been a man. Such wealth inclines those present at the assembly room dance to initially praise Darcy's other qualities even more vigorously, as shown when immediately after her reference to his income, Austin reports that the men pronounced him to be a fine figure of a man, whilst the ladies declared he was much handsomer than Mr Bingley, who is not as wealthy. The clear implication is that male wealth can dazzle and impress, which results in fawning behaviour on numerous occasions within the novel as a whole. A splendid example of fawning female behaviour when faced with a powerful wealthy male is seen in chapter 10. Caroline Bingley is clearly desperate to ensnare Darcy as a husband, and so emits a veritable torrent of bland, complimentary platitudes. He is writing a letter, and is clearly in no mood for chit-chat. She attempts to start the conversation by crying, How delighted Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter! On receiving no response, she moves to a more direct compliment. You write uncommonly fast. This is textbook fatic talk, language aimed at building a relationship socially rather than conveying any meaning. The fact her language is so bland and pointless highlights her subservient position and attitude towards such a wealthy man. The irony is that such inane attempts at ingratiation only result in irritating Darcy, as Eliza observes towards the very end of the novel. You are sick of civility, of deference, of officious attention. So in Austen's idealistic, and I think unrealistic, ending, it is actually the women who maintain their self-respect by insisting on a more measured attitude toward to the more powerful sex, 
both Jane and Eliza reject humiliatingly vacuous flattery, who end up with both the happiest and the most prosperous marriages. The writer also implies that attitudes towards men can alternate unhelpfully between different extremes, when perhaps a more considered approach might be more judicious. From Darcy initially being looked at with great admiration by the community as a whole, this far too rapidly switches to being described as the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world, and everybody hoped that he would never come there again. Austin's hyperbole by using the superlatives proudest, most disagreeable man, not just in Hertfordshire, but actually the entire world, hints at a society that enjoys simplistic categorization of men as either heroes or villains. The reality is that very few people within the community have been introduced to Darcy at this point, let alone spoken with him, and so any judgments are likely to be based on the flimsiest of superficial actions and appearances. In this case, Darcy refusing to dance very much and preferring only to speak to people he knows. Indeed, throughout the novel, Austen shows that judgments about men and people can be made too quickly, such as, for example, Eliza's rushed conclusions about Wickham and Darcy, hence the inclusion of the noun prejudice within the novel's title. In the novel as a whole, Austen shows that the most respected men are valued for their intelligence and independent strength of character and mind. When Charlotte Lucas agrees to marry Mr Collins, the male equivalent of Caroline Bingley perhaps, in his um, predilection for limply ingratiating himself in an attempt to curry favours with the rich and powerful, Elizabeth feels that her old friend is demeaning herself through the match with such a weak, vain, foolish man. Indeed, she feels so let down by it that it results in an awkward restraint which kept them mutually silent on the subject. In contrast, when Eliza speaks to her father about marrying Darcy, he warns her of the consequences of marrying someone she didn't truly respect. I know that you could be neither happy nor respectable unless you truly esteemed your husband, unless you looked up to him as a superior. Eliza is able to reassure her father and it is clear she is excited about many aspects of her future life as a wife, including learning from him and being guided from him in some areas. It is important to reference the context here. Austin's world was one in which the legal system specifically stated men were superior to women, and one in which the man generally received a far superior education to his female counterparts. Whereas nowadays, the idea of a woman feeling she has to marry a superior would be dismissed as prejudice and nonsensical, in the relationship of Darcy and Eliza in Pride and Prejudice, Austin shows that a loving, intelligent man would be the ideal figurehead to help a woman broaden her outlook and understanding of the world. Let's now refer back to the mark scheme to highlight sections of this sample essay which meet the criteria for the top band, which includes the grade 9. First, assessment objective 1. The question is imploring us to explore how Austin presents attitudes towards men, having previously made the point that men are judged to a significant extent by their wealth, in the section on screen, I develop that point further to suggest that such attitudes also incline people to be more favourable about other aspects of the person, in this case his physical appearance. So this is conceptualised, as it is not merely retelling the plot, but is based on the development of an idea which answers the question. Note also the use of precise quotations. I simply trim and crop as I need in order to back up my point. Now to assessment objective two. Here I'm analysing the writer's methods. How does Austen make the reader join with her in poking fun at Caroline Bingley's ultimately doomed attempts to entrance Mr Darcy? Well, she uses direct speech to showcase Miss Bingley's particularly inane phatic talk, so inane that Mr Darcy is able to get away without answering at all. Note how I talk about the effects of this phatic talk. It really does highlight her subservient position and attitude towards a healthy man. Finally, on to assessment objective three. 
Here I use the word context to specifically state to the examiner that I am addressing this assessment objective. I reference the legal system of Austin's time and the differing education of men and women to add further insight into Mr. Bennett's suggestion that Eliza should marry someone she could look up to as superior. Whereas nowadays this suggestion would be furiously dismissed, within the context of Austin's time, it makes sense. Marrying a man could also theoretically represent an opportunity to evolve and learn. The hope now is that having watched, made notes and thought about this longish video resource, you have increased your chances of scaling the dizzying heights of a grade 9 for your GCSE English Literature Examination on Pride and Prejudice. Do post comments if you feel one aspect of this video has been particularly helpful or if you feel that it would have been better to present the information in a different way or have focused on some other areas. Good luck for your exam. You've been watching Schofield on Shakespeare.